All right, welcome to the last talk in this session. Uh, Michael Yatora will speak about probability polynomials associated with edge covers of graphs. Thank you. I thank the organizers and the individuals that have stepped in to chair the session. And, and thank those of you that are here for my talk. I guess for this particular session, I guess I'm the, in uh, music terms, this would be the main act, but it's one of these occasions where I'm very modest and I would say that the main act isn't as talented as those opening acts that came prior. <laughs> But that's my modest nature speaking and the fact that we had some very good talks previously. And I'd like to thank those speakers as well. Okay, so I'm going to be talking on probability polynomials associated with edge covers. So edge covers are collections of edges within a graph that essentially see all the vertices of the graph itself. So we're going to have finite simple graphs, the order, i.e. number of vertices is n, size, number of edges is e. So we're going to let f sub i of g, that's going to be the number of edge covers containing i edges. Okay, so that's the f sub i of g. And the original edge cover polynomial that was introduced by Akbari and Obudi, they defined it by simply taking x to the i power, and then the coefficient would be that f sub i of g. And then you sum from the edge cover number up to the number of edges, because if you take all of the edges, we may obtain an edge cover, provided we assume that there are no isolated vertices. And in this case, we have this beta of g is the edge cover number, the size of a smallest edge cover. Yeah, and if g has an isolated vertex, we just say that this is zero because it's impossible to find an edge cover in such an instance. And so I'm just taking actually a modification of that idea and assigning a probability to selecting an edge cover. So this is the edge cover probability polynomial. So we fix a uniform probability of selecting an edge between 0 and 1. And then if we add up the probabilities of selecting all of the edge covers, we get this polynomial in row. And we see here the coefficient this is counting up the number of edge covers with i edges, and then rho to the i means we took i edges, and 1 minus rho to the e minus i means we didn't take e minus i edges. Okay, so this can actually be obtained algebraically just by taking the original edge cover polynomial and replacing x with rho over rho, I mean rho over 1 minus rho, and multiplying by 1 minus rho to the e. So essentially, any parameter polynomial defined in this manner can be turned into a probability polynomial by this sort of transformation here. Okay, so here's a quick example using a P5, a path on five vertices. Okay, the edge cover number is three. If we look at the order three edge covers, there are two of them, or size three edge covers, I should say. And then taking all the edges is an edge cover, so that's just 1 for the f sub 4. And then we plug into the formula, add up the probabilities, and we get this polynomial in row. Okay, so what I'd like to do right now is just talk about a few interesting properties of this polynomial, and then something that's a little more extensive beyond that. So Akbari and Obudi, when they introduced this polynomial, they demonstrated the following recursion. Now, this recursion can be translated algebraically into a recursion for the edge cover probability polynomial. This can all be demonstrated algebraically. So here we have deleting just the edge. Here we have deleting the vertex u. Here we have deleting the vertex v. Here we have deleting the vertices u and v. Rather than giving the algebraic demonstration, which is just lines of equalities. I'm going to give a counting argument just to show where this particular equality and recursion comes from. So let's look at the graph itself. So the graph has some structure. U and V are joined by an edge. U has some neighbors. V has some neighbors, and they might overlap. So let's look at the first term. The idea is if we remove U, V, and consider all the remaining edge covers, 
we have to include at least one edge attached to U and at least one edge attached to V. But then what happens is we may or may not take UV. So here we're gathering up all of the edge covers that have an edge adjacent to or incident on U and an edge incident on V, and then we may or may not take UV either way. So there are still more edge covers to consider. What about those that don't include any edges incident on U or any incident on V or either? Okay, in those instances, we have to take the edge UV. So we have this row here to indicate we're taking the edge UV. If we remove U and consider all edge covers, we're going to get all of those edge covers that include at least one edge adjacent to V. Okay, so we're going to have, in this case, we didn't take any of the edges adjacent to U, except for UV, hence the minus one, and then we cover the rest. Okay, so that's if we don't include any additional edges beyond UV incident on U. We could do the same symmetric argument if we don't include any additional edges besides UV incident on V. And in which case, we get a very similar looking term, just replacing the U with V. And then we may take into consideration edge covers which leave out all the other edges incident on U and all the other edges incident on V and just take UV incident on U and V. So if we select here, we delete out the UV vertices and then just cover what's here and then we take UV, okay? So that's the counting argument that demonstrates the recursive relationship here. Uh, there's a special case where if you take one of those vertices to the appended vertex, then it simplifies nicely because the degree of appendant vertex is one. If U is appendant vertex, then U is isolated if we remove UV or we remove V. So those re resulting probabilities are both zero. So if you simplify this expression down, taking away the V leaves no nothing, taking away the UV leaves no nothing, and the degree of U is one, you just reduce to this right-hand side here, okay? So that works out nicely. If you wanted to start off by working with a recursive uh, argument, you might want to start with dependent vertices and then do this recursion because it's much simpler. And then corollaries. Uh, because with a path, you know, we have a pendant vertex, we have two pendant vertices on paths, we can prove the following recursion when we're dealing with just a path graph. If we take UV to be one of those two pendant vertices, run the recursion with U as your pendant, then we're going to have the following simplification because take a path minus U, the, this one pendant vertex, it's just a path on one less vertex, and then take away UV, it's just a path on two less vertices. And then you've got your two here, starting cases of P1 and P2. Yeah, it turns out that if we solve that recursion, which it just, it's a recursion that steps back two. So solving that is equivalent to solving for roots of a quadratic equation. So in this case, if you solve the quadratic equation and write down the resulting solution to that recursion, we can get a closed form for the probability of selecting an edge cover of a path. Okay. Oftentimes, it helps to have a way to calculate the edge cover polynomial for paths because many similar graphs, like a cycle, for example, can be reduced to, if you want the edge cover probability polynomial, you can reduce it down to appropriate edge cover probability polynomials of appropriate paths. And we already know how to calculate it precisely in a closed form for paths. Okay, so that's just a general idea. In, in other words, that's actually the underlying framework from which the following results were built because we had these recursions and then things could be broken down into probabilities on paths and then induction could be implemented. We could run with inductive arguments. So these inductive, these inductive arguments were in the context of this notion of uniform optimality. So take a class of graphs. 
and then look at all potential probabilities between 0 and 1 on selecting an edge. Then look at the probability polynomials of all graphs in that class. If we find that 1 here, if we find that one graph has a largest probability among all other graphs for all probabilities, we say it's uniformly most probable. And if it's the only one, it's unique uniformly most probable. So this is interesting because we're looking for an optimal result. And maybe it's unique, but we're trying to figure out which one has the best likelihood among all probabilities. Doesn't always exist. But when it does, it's interesting to know the structure. And analogously, uniformly least probable, the lowest probability within the class. Or it might be unique. There might be one. So these recursive arguments, this notion of boiling things down to paths, led to the following results. Now, the first two of which, these were demonstrated by Akbari and Obudi, but in the context of the standard edge cover polynomial. But if it works with the edge cover polynomial for all x, then it's going to work when we do it for the probabilities as well. So it's not surprising that the path is the uniquely most probable. We can find an edge cover, in this case, more readily than this case where we have a star graph, because the star graph has the most pendants. And we have to take, in order to get an edge cover, we have to take all those pendant edges. And here, the path only has two pendant edges. So here's most probable, least probable in the context of trees. You know, edges is number of vertices minus one. So all we did was ask, what happens if we step up the number of edges by one? So now let's go to unicyclic graphs, connected graphs with the edges equal to the number of vertices. Not surprising, we get analogous graphs that satisfy uniformly most probable. It was a path, now it's a cycle least number of pendant vertices. Then we go down, just take the star and add in an edge, make a triangle with pendant vert vertices hanging off of one of the vertices. That has the most pendants, but it also has them strategically placed. Okay, Because we could distribute the pendants over in other vertices, but this is the best one in terms of least likely probability. Okay. So these weren't too difficult. It's just the number of base cases to check and the number of cases in general increments. So stepping up to a class where the graphs are connected and then the number of edges is the number of vertices plus one, that again increased the number of cases and the number of base cases that had to be considered. So the graphs were essentially broken down into various structures within this class. And it just so happens that this was my conjecture in that take a cycle and add an edge, a corded cycle, and then we would obtain the uniformly most probable. So we went paths, add an edge, cycles, add an edge, a corded cycle. It just so happens that those were only the most probable in the n equals 5, 6, and 7. And the specific corded cycles we take is so that the edge creates a four cycle within it. What happens beyond that? Well, when n equals 8 or greater than or equal to 10, it just so happens that we get a different structure for the most probable, in which we take a C4 and then the remaining vertices on a Cn minus 4 and a single edge joining a vertice of the C4 to the Cn minus 4. And those become the unique, uniformly most probable. Now here I haven't said anything about n equals 9. That's because these two scenarios are unique. In the n equals 9 instance, a graph of this structure and a graph of this structure actually have the same exact probability. So if you take a C4 and a C5 here, or you take a C9 up here, it actually has the same exact probability. So it's not unique in that case, because they're not the same graph. Okay, 
So it was interesting to see the jump from this to this here. Of course, we have to wait until n equals 8 to even have graphs like this, where the smaller component is a C4. Okay. And then this one seems to be directly in line with the previous instances in the two previous classes, the trees and the unicyclic graphs. We have the only way to get a chord on a cycle is to have it at least a four cycle. So here we have a corded four cycle, and then we hang pendants, hang these pendant vertices off of one of the end vertices of that chord. Okay? We actually, if we hung them off another vertex that's not on the chord, we would get a higher, in this case, probability rather than a lower probability of finding one. So it's interesting to see the structure in this case remains somewhat intact for the least probable, but the most probable changed a bit. So I guess what might be interesting to do is explore these analogous results to see what happens if we have other graph classes. Uh, what other things can we say between the correspondence of the edge cover polynomial and the edge cover probability polynomial, vice versa, results from one can translate to the other. And compare these results or derive analogous results for similar graph polynomials. So vertex cover polynomials, edge cover of edges, just make those now, counting those collections of edges as the coefficients, and make probabilities from those, and see what sorts of results result. Okay? And there we go. Yes? No. No, I haven't looked at anything analytic thus far. I've kind of been jumping topic to topic. So <laughs> I had this was something I was like, oh, my colleagues and I were working on some similar results for a uh, student's thesis. And I was like, oh, let me see where we can take this. So, yeah. So it, it's rather in its early stages. Yeah. Yes? Um, the proof technique for these optimality results, are you showing that they're coefficient-wise greatest or least, or is it something different? It's something different. It, it's strictly using the recursive formulas and then checking base cases as a result. So it's, it's strong induction. The majority of it is strong induction, checking base cases. So there are explicit formulas that I could check against each other, represented in terms of path and cycle probabilities. So I wasn't focusing explicitly on the coefficients. I had formulas for exactly the objects I was looking at. And do you know if, I mean, are they, do you know if they are coefficient-wise greatest and least, or? That's the thing. The, the question is, um, obviously, if it's coefficient greater, then it's going to be bigger. Right. But it's an open question as to whether, and these are sometimes called reliability results. There are a number of papers written by colleagues of mine, uh, Charlie Suffol, um, um, John Sockerman, Dan Gross. Anyway, there's a conjecture that does uniformity imply coefficient optimality in every single coefficient. That's not known. It's not known if the coefficients are guaranteed to be greater than or equal to. Yeah. So one way is apparent, the other way is an open question. Yes? Yeah. Uh, is there any result uh, related to perfect matching or matching? Because the terms I'm seeing, this G minus U, V, G minus U, and G minus V, is appears, they are appearing counting, matching in the hybrid mode, and they, are, they call it the, this, this imposing to matching. Oh, okay. I wouldn't be surprised because having, having a, a perfect matching is an edge cover. So, so I guess. Like if if you if you if you're able to find independent edges for every vertex in the graph, then then it's it's an edge cover. 
So, so there's a relationship there. Uh, then, uh, then you can consider this uh, method of uh, this method of uh, imposing. It is also uh, uh, noted by Donald Dickens. Oh, okay. Yeah, this okay. method of imposing, yeah. imposing perfect actions. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That could be considered. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions? So if not, let's thank the speaker again.